So we've already learned that using variables can be incredibly helpful in keeping track of what we're doing in a program. And we know that in the data tab, we can make our own variables whenever we'd like. However, there's a bunch of built-in variables that are incredibly helpful as well. So if you look at the motion tab and scroll down, you can see that there's an X position, a Y position, and a direction for every sprite. And you can just click on the little checkbox beside it and see what the values of those default variables are. So these are built-in variables, and you'll find them in most of the tabs. So for example, the costume number, the backdrop name, the size of the sprite, all of these things that look like an oval like that are built-in variables. So in sound, we see there's tempo and volume. Uh, in the pen ta uh, tab, there's nothing. In sensing, there's an answer, there's a loudness, a timer, there's a whole bunch of different built-in variables that we can use. So let's look at a few of them. So let's start with sound. So this tempo built-in variable by default would be set to 60. And so let's just create something that will use that tempo. So for example, when we press the space key, if we'd like to, we could say, let's repeat a few times. Let's go 10 times, that's fine. Uh, and let's go back to sound and say, I want to play the drum for 0.25 beats. So if I run that, you'll hear just the drum playing at a constant rate at 60 beats per second. Uh, and it's happening for 0.25 beats. So in other words, a quarter of a second. So when we do this, uh, we could add additional things. Let's say we changed the tempo inside of this. Let's change it by 10. Well, because I'm repeating 10 times, changing that tempo by 10, that means I'm going to adjust the tempo by a total of 100. So when we're done, this tempo should be at 160. And you can hear that the drum is going to increase in speed because we're adjusting the tempo as we go. And of course, you could do that with nested loops as well. Maybe I decide that inside of this, I'm going to repeat five more times. And I'm going to, uh, let's say, instead of playing a drum, maybe we decide we're going to play a uh, cowbell. And we change the tempo inside this repeat. And let's repeat it two times instead of five, just to keep it a little more reasonable. Now notice that the tempo is already at 160 because we changed it last time. So maybe I need to reset. So I'll set the tempo to 60 at the start, then we'll do this. Now, it's useful to think through what will the tempo be at the end of this? Well, we're repeating 10 times, playing the drum, and then we repeat twice, play the cowbell, and change the tempo. So that means for every one of these repeat tens, I have changed the tempo by 20 because I repeat this twice. So that should change it by 200, so I should be at 260. And let's double check. And sure enough, we are. So there's a very quick example of how tempo can work. Uh, to allow us to play, in this case, horrible sounds, but uh, you can use it to make much nicer things. Now, we'll hide that variable, and let's go over to the Sensing tab, and I'm gonna use the Ask block. So we can ask, let's tie this to when you press the space key as well, and we'll ask what is your name and we'll wait. So if I press the space key, you'll see a little bar shows up on the bottom and I can type something in and hit enter, uh, and now that variable, which has stored the answer that I just typed in, is this default variable, this built-in variable called answer. And I'll show it right there. So you can see that it's holding whatever I just put in. So for example, maybe I decide that I want to say hello there to whoever just typed in their name. So to do that, I'm just going to go to the say block, which is under looks, and we'll go to say. And then I want to say, hello there, and I want to put in the answer. Now, unfortunately, if I chuck the answer in like that, it completely replaces what I had in there before. So if I press the space key and type in Dan, my cat will say Dan, but I'd like it to say hello there, Dan. To do that, I need to go to the operators tab, and I'm going to use this join command, which is a simplistic way of using the word concatenation, which we'll encounter later in the course. Uh, and I'll just put the answer here, and I'll join, hello there, and then I put a comma and a space, and then the answer. 
And if I join all that together, now I should be able to say Dan, and it works out just fine. And of course, we can ask questions about this too. Maybe I say I want to do an if statement. So I'll say something like if uh, the answer is equal to something. So maybe if the answer is Dan, I'll say hello there, Dan. Uh, but maybe I'll also say, and you know what, this would be better with an if else. Let's say that if the answer is Dan, I'll say one thing, but otherwise I'll say something else. So I'll just duplicate that and I'll say good day, whoever. So in this case, now if I press the space bar and I type in Eli, I'll get good day, Eli. And if I type in Dan, it'll say, hello there, Dan. So that works out fine. And again, it doesn't matter what I put in as long as it's not Dan. If I type in Zoe, I get good day, Zoe. Or if I type in Bree, good day, Bree, etc. So it doesn't matter what I put in. As long as it's not equal to Dan, it'll do what's in the else here. So the join just allows me to do that. Now, one other thing that we can use, so we've looked at the built-in tempo variable, the built-in answer variable. Both of those are helpful. Let's try something else now. So I'll hide the answer. And in the sensing tab as well, we have the timer, uh, which can be really helpful as well. So the timer, if I show it, you can see that this timer is currently at like 1,770, which is really large. But if I click the flag, it automatically jumps back down to zero. So the timer is just showing me how many seconds have gone by since my project began, since they pressed the flag or since we've clicked on this reset timer. Let's button. use that timer to make a little guessing game. And all that we'll do is we'll have uh, the beginning of the game. We'll simply have Scratch pick a number from two to eight, and then we'll have to try to click a button at the appropriate amount of time. So if it picks, say, the number four, we have to try to wait for four seconds and then press a button as close to four seconds as we can. So if we want that to happen, we know that we're gonna have to make a variable. So we're gonna have to say something like, time to wait because we need to hold the random number in something. Now let's tie that to when the flag is clicked and say when the flag is clicked, let's simply pick a value for time to wait. So in other words, we'll set the time to wait to be a random number, which we can find in the operators. And let's just make that a random number from two seconds to eight seconds. And now that we've got that, <coughs> What we can do uh, is let's f start by just saying what the number is. So let's go into our looks and we will say, and what we'd like to do is just say, press a key in and then we want the time to wait. Now again, if you recall, if I chuck the time to wait in, it replaces everything. So we need to go back to operators and use the join block and we'll say, press a key in and then I'll insert time to wait. Now I'd like to say seconds at the end of that, so I'm gonna use another join block. Click that in, and then I'll just say seconds at the end of that, and drag the whole combination back into my say block. So let's see if it works. So if I click the flag, okay, press a key in two seconds, again, eight seconds, and you can see that the timer, of course, is resetting each time. So great, that's working out just fine. Now we can hide the time to wait, and we'll leave the timer there for now so that we can cheat as we get the game going and then eventually we can hide it. So what we want to do now is we want to keep track of when did they actually click a button or press a button. So let's go to events and we'll say when you press any key. So at any point when you press the key, we need to see how far away from the time to wait is the actual timer. So a automatic thought there might be, well, let's just subtract. So we could just say, if we just take the time to wait and subtract the timer, then we have the difference between them. The only problem is that with that one is, what if we wait too long <coughs> and we end up, well, if we wait too long, we'll end up with a positive. If we go too quickly, we'll end up with a negative. So we need to remove the negative sign. To remove a negative sign in Scratch, all we do is go to the Operators tab, and down here there's math operators. I'll just use the absolute value, ABS, and we'll throw that in there. So now I've got the absolute value of the time to wait minus the timer, so it's just gonna be a positive number. 
And now we just want to compare it. So let's bring in a less than. I can say if the absolute value of the time to wait minus the timer is less than whatever we want our trigger to be, let's say one second, then we could use an if, and, if else block. So let's throw that in. And the reason we'd use an if else is if it is less than one second, we can give them a congratulations method message. So we could say something like, nice, that was super close. And otherwise, we could duplicate that. And we could say, ooh, keep trying. Now, let's double check it and make sure this actually works. So if we take a little look here and give it a run, I'll zoom in so we can see it. So in five seconds, I'm going to automatically here just choose something silly. So I'll press it and I get, oh, keep trying. So that's great. Let's try again. Five seconds again. I'm going to cheat and just see the five seconds there. So we'll go now and we get nice, super close. So let's just test it out. Make sure it works as well when we go too high. So I'll wait until it hits seven, but we'll still get it right. Great. Still get super close. This time I'll wait and I'll let it go way beyond the time actually desired. So we'll wait until it's about nine seconds and then I'll press it just so we can test it out. All right, so we've got it in all situations. It seems to be working. So the only thing I would do now is just go back to sensing and hide that timer. And now we have a basic uh, timing game.